Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. This is the last part of my series on the solar system. In parts 1 to 3 we've learned about the various objects in the solar system, how they orbit and how we've explored our solar system. Today we'll look at how the solar system formed and the effects of gravity on planets and other objects. Gravity is the most important principle in solar systems. They form when a large interstellar cloud of gas and dust collapses due to gravity, and gravity dictates how they evolve over time. Planets orbit stars, and moons orbit planets due to gravity. Most of our solar system's mass ended up in the Sun, but some was moving around the Sun too fast to fall in. Some of this material forms planets, asteroids and so on, which have orbited the Sun ever since. The cloud of gas and dust that forms a solar system starts out stretching over three dimensions, but as it collapses, it forms a two-dimensional disk, rotating in one specific direction. This forms the ecliptic, and most orbiting bodies closely follow this plane of the ecliptic. If you'd like to understand why this happens, see the Minute Physics video, Why is the Solar System Flat?, linked in the video description. An orbiting body is attracted inward by the force of gravity, shown here in green, but it's moving fast enough in another direction that it misses the central body. The velocity, shown here in purple, is 90 degrees from the force of gravity in a circular orbit and at a varying angle in an elliptical orbit. The force of gravity produces acceleration. This force speeds up the orbiting body after apoapsis, when it is moving towards the central body, essentially falling towards the Sun. And gravity slows it down after periapsis, when it moves away from the central body. Gravity and velocity are both lowest at apoapsis, and highest at periapsis. So, gravity weakens as the distance from the central body increases. A high-mass body exerts a gravitational force on nearby objects, but the force is stronger on the side nearer the central body. This causes various tidal effects, and can distort objects or even tear them apart. I covered Earth's oceanic tides in The Moon Part 3, and similar effects would occur on other worlds with liquids at the surface. In The Moon Part 1, I also discussed tidal locking, which causes the Moon to rotate exactly once per orbit, always showing the same side to Earth. Tidal locking is common in the solar system, and Pluto and its moon Charon are both tidally locked to each other. Gravity is also responsible for the asteroid belt. Originally, this region had enough material to form another planet as massive as Mars, and some small protoplanets, like Ceres, did form. But Jupiter's gravity disturbed the protoplanets, preventing them from becoming a full terrestrial planet. Collisions were too fast. Protoplanets smashed each other instead of fusing together. Most of the debris was lost, thrown inward to bombard the inner planets as asteroids, or flung out of the solar system completely. Some was drawn into Jupiter's orbit, following Jupiter as a Trojan, or leading it as a Greek. More on those later. The largest part of the asteroid belt that survives today is the dwarf planet Ceres, with just one five thousandth the mass of Earth. In a similar way, the giant planets disrupted the formation of moons around them. If a moon starts to form in the wrong place, it can be ripped apart by the planet's gravity, the particles scattered into a ring around the planet. And gravity continues to shape these rings. Small shepherd moons orbit within or near the rings. Their gravity clears a ring gap along their orbit, and pulls nearby stray particles back into position. But why does this destruction of moons happen? There are different levels of gravity at the sides nearest to and furthest from the central body, also called the primary. These differences are greater for a large orbiting body, also called the satellite. The tidal forces due to the primary overwhelm the gravitational forces holding the satellite together, and it gets torn apart, or just fails to form into a large body in the first place. The strength of tidal forces is related to the ratio of the size of the satellite to the satellite's orbital distance. So tidal forces are stronger close to the primary, and only prevent satellite formation within a certain distance, called the Roche limit. You should know this name, but don't worry about the complex maths needed to calculate the distance. Comet Schumacher-Levy 9 was torn apart in 1994, when it entered Jupiter's Roche limit. We can see this effect on the right. In the top picture, the satellite is far from the Roche limit, and is more or less spherical. In the second picture, it's close to the Roche limit, and is visibly distorted. And the last three pictures show it at the Roche limit, being torn apart. 
Satellites aren't held together only by gravity. They also hold themselves together by elastic forces, that is, by intermolecular bonds, otherwise known as being solid. If these forces are strong enough, an object that formed outside the Roche limit can get slightly closer without being destroyed. Artificial satellites can orbit Earth well within the Roche limit, also helped by the fact that they're very small. Outside the Roche limit, satellites are affected in other ways by tidal forces, such as oceanic tides and tidal locking, which we already discussed. There is also deformation, which we saw in these two images. Just as water on Earth is stretched towards and away from the Moon, a solid satellite is stretched towards and away from its primary, changing its shape from spherical to elongated. This also happens to rotating objects due to centrifugal force. And there's tidal heating. As the satellite rotates, it is stretched in different directions, and as it orbits, it gets closer to and further from its primary, changing the strength of the tidal forces. It is stretched at periapsis and relaxes at apoapsis. This causes internal heating due to friction. This is why many of Jupiter's and Saturn's moons are volcanically active, with liquid water. We're all familiar with the idea that planets are spherical. The reason is a condition called hydrostatic equilibrium. Imagine a planet made entirely of liquid water. The surface will be smooth and even, forming a sphere. This is because of two opposing forces. Gravity pulls all the water towards the planet's centre of mass, and the resulting pressure pushes outward. When the planet reaches a spherical shape of a certain size, these two forces cancel out. The forces, and the planet, are in equilibrium. Hydro means water, static means stationary, and equilibrium means the forces cancel out. Solid objects do the same thing, but solids are rigid, and so more gravity is needed to form a round shape. Generally, objects more than 500 kilometers in diameter, like Ceres at 950 kilometers, reach hydrostatic equilibrium, but smaller objects, like the 17-kilometre asteroid Gaspra, do not. Of course, that's not the complete picture. Earth has mountains due to tectonic activity, and planets are slightly ellipsoid due to their rotation, usually as an oblate spheroid. But they're close enough to spherical. However, the solar system has a lot of moving parts. Often they collide, sometimes with dramatic results. Asteroids, comets, and even small planets have caused tremendous disruption, such as impact craters, mostly tiny but sometimes very large, such as Mimas's Herschel crater. Objects that don't spin in the same direction as the rest of the solar system. Earth's axis is tilted 23.5 degrees, Uranus is tilted more than 90 degrees, and Venus is tilted at 177 degrees. It spins backwards. Moon capture, such as Uranus's largest moon, Triton, probably a dwarf planet from the Kuiper Belt. And moon formation. We think our moon was created by an ancient collision with Theia, a planet about the size of Mars. So we've explained how the solid surface of planets got their shape. What about atmospheres? Some planets have very thick atmospheres. Some objects, like our moon, have very thin atmospheres, and some have no atmosphere at all. An atmosphere is made of gas particles, attracted to a body by its gravity but gas particles have high kinetic energy and so move very fast. If the planet's gravity is not strong enough, the gas particles may reach escape velocity and leave the object. There are several factors that influence an object's atmosphere. Greater mass increases the escape velocity, so high mass objects are better at retaining gas. Hotter gas particles have more kinetic energy, so are more likely to escape. Inner terrestrial planets are hotter than the gas planets, so they have thinner atmospheres. Lighter particles have higher speed at a given temperature, which is why Earth has virtually no helium in its atmosphere. And the solar wind can strip planets of their atmosphere. The solar wind is stronger close to the Sun, which is why Pluto has an atmosphere, but the more massive Mercury does not. And planets with a strong magnetosphere, like Earth, deflect much of the solar wind, protecting the atmosphere from being blown away. Earlier, we considered how gravity produces elliptical orbits. Now, let's look at a few other ways gravity can influence orbits. We look at perturbation, orbital resonance, and Lagrangian points. Starting with perturbation. If there were only two bodies, such as the Sun and Earth, the orbits would be perfect ellipses. But there are many other massive bodies which change the motion of other bodies over time. Jupiter has a strong effect on the inner planets, 
and Neptune adjusts the orbits of Kuiper belt objects such as Pluto, and we call this effect perturbation. We can calculate these perturbations and produce data tables for the past and future locations of solar system objects. These tables are called ephemerides, the singular is ephemeris, from the Latin for diary. These calculations are extremely complex, and with modern observations and computing power, we can only make accurate ephemerides for a few centuries into the past and future. And orbits are chaotic. This means that if we change the position or velocity of any object in the solar system, even a little, the changes in its influence on the other bodies magnifies over time. Or if our measurements are off by a few metres, our calculations become less accurate. An asteroid moving near a small moon might move the moon further from its planet, which changes its influence on other planets, and before you know it, all your ephemerides have changed. Almost the opposite of chaotic orbits is orbital resonance. This can occur when two or more bodies orbit a larger one, and the satellites are at distances where their orbital periods are in a simple ratio. Around Jupiter, for every orbit Ganymede completes, Europa completes exactly two orbits, and Io completes exactly four. The moons do drift off slightly during their orbits, but when they pass each other, their gravity pulls each other back on course, maintaining their exact orbital ratios. Similarly, Neptune keeps Pluto in check. Pluto completes two orbits for every three orbits Neptune completes. This prevents Pluto and Neptune from ever colliding with each other. The last bit of orbital mechanics before we get to planetary formation is Lagrangian points. Consider a satellite in space near the Earth and Moon. Near the Earth, Earth's gravity would cause the satellite to orbit Earth, and near the Moon, the Moon's gravity is stronger, causing it to orbit the Moon assuming the satellite's motion doesn't make it crash or leave the Earth-Moon system. But at a certain point between the two, the gravity from each will cancel out. A satellite placed here will keep its position between the Earth and Moon, orbiting the Earth at the same rate as the Moon, despite being closer to the Earth. This position is called Lagrange 1, or L1. These diagrams are to scale, except for the size of the Earth and Moon, though I've approximated the Moon's orbit as a circle. Similarly, some way past the Moon, the satellite should orbit slower than the Moon, but the Moon's gravity adds to the Earth's gravity, making the satellite orbit slightly faster. At a certain point, the satellite will orbit the Earth at the same rate as the Moon, remaining on the far side of the Moon. This position is called L2. There's a similar point on the other side of the Earth. From here, the satellite feels the gravitational pull of both Earth and Moon in the same direction. With this stronger gravity, the satellite has to be slightly further out to match the Moon's orbit. This position is called L3. This is the only position I've labelled inaccurately, as the true location is extremely close to the Moon's orbit. L4 and L5 are at the corners of equilateral triangles, with the other corners at the centres of mass of the two bodies, Earth and the Moon in these examples. In a circular orbit, L4 and L5 lie on the orbit. It's slightly different in elliptical orbits. L4 is ahead of the Moon's orbit, while L5 is behind the orbit. Objects such as asteroids can become trapped at these two Lagrangian points. Jupiter's L4 and L5 points are the locations of the Greeks and Trojans we discussed earlier. Let's have a look at some uses for Lagrangian points. The Earth-Sun L1 point is used by spacecraft to observe the Sun, such as SOHO. By staying between the Earth and Sun, it has a close and clear line of sight to Earth to report its findings. The Earth-Sun L2 point is used by telescopes to make observations in Earth's shadow without interference from the Sun's light, such as the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. L3 has little practical use outside of science fiction, where sometimes an alien spacecraft or even an entire planet hides at the Earth-Sun L3 point and L4 and L5 have been proposed as locations for radio telescopes linked by interferometry, creating an effective telescopic diameter of hundreds of millions of kilometres. And finally, we come to planetary formation. This is a controversial subject in astrophysics, with many competing theories, and almost every space probe, as well as the Apollo moon missions, have a mission objective related to learning more about the formation of our solar system. Also, we don't know if our solar system is typical, or if most are quite different from ours. We'll concentrate on the most widely accepted theory, core accretion. 
and we'll split this into three sections. Rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. And ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. The solar system started out as a huge nebula of cool gas and dust. This was about 74% hydrogen and 24% helium, with a few heavier metals made from nuclear fusion in old stars and scattered into space when they went supernova. In astrophysics, metal refers to any element heavier than helium. This nebula contracted due to gravity, forming the sun at the centre, with a large spinning disk around it. As the disk contracted, particles came closer, collided with each other more frequently, and stuck together to form larger, more massive particles. These more massive particles fused with each other, gaining more and more mass over time. As they increased in mass, their gravity also increased, making it easier to attract even more mass. They gradually formed into asteroids, planetesimals, and eventually full-sized planets. This process formed the terrestrial planets, and is called core accretion. Now for the gas giants. The inner solar system near the Sun is very warm. Around Mars, the temperature is 220 Kelvin, or minus 50 degrees Celsius, which is hot enough to sublimate ice, turning it into vapour. This isn't true on Earth, but it is in a vacuum. Between Mars and Jupiter, the temperature drops enough for ice to stay frozen. This means that in the region where Jupiter and Saturn formed, the dust included solid chunks of ice that weren't present in the inner solar system. With more solid material to accrete, Jupiter and Saturn became more massive, about 10 times the mass of Earth. The gas giants are made of mostly hydrogen and helium. These gases are too light to be retained in the atmospheres of smaller terrestrial planets but the more massive cores of Jupiter and Saturn gathered up the hydrogen and helium in their orbits, becoming ever more massive and ever better at gathering more hydrogen and helium. The distance from the Sun where water freezes is called the frost line. Lastly, the ice giants. You don't need to know how the ice giants formed for the GCSE, and even astrophysicists don't really understand it. The simplest explanation is that they formed similarly to the gas giants, but Uranus and Neptune have more ices than Jupiter and Saturn, and less hydrogen and helium. In astrophysics, ice refers to any chemical compound with a relatively high freezing point. There are actually several frost lines, since different molecules have different freezing points. The frost lines for molecules such as ammonia, methane, and carbon dioxide and monoxide are further out than the frost line for water. This made it easier for Uranus and Neptune to capture these compounds as they formed. However, Computer models don't support this. Our ice giants would have taken too long to gather their ices, and by the time they did, the hydrogen and helium that they have would have been blown away by the solar wind. A popular answer to this problem is called planetary migration, and you do need to know this for the GCSE. This hypothesis says that the giant planets have changed their orbits significantly since they formed. Originally, Uranus and Neptune formed much closer to the Sun, with Uranus further out than Neptune. The Sun was cooler then, and the frost lines were closer to the Sun. Uranus and Neptune could have gathered their ices more quickly. At some point, Jupiter and Saturn came into a 2 to 1 orbital resonance. This boosted their gravitational effects, and they pushed Uranus and Neptune outwards. Neptune overtook Uranus, becoming the outermost planet as it is today. At this point, the Kuiper belt was much closer to the Sun than it is now. When Neptune reached the Kuiper belt, it disturbed these objects, pushing them inward. When they encountered Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity pushed them further out. This scattered the Kuiper belt objects to their present location and pushed Jupiter closer to the Sun, breaking its orbital resonance with Saturn. Our last topic on the solar system is water. Liquid water is considered essential for life, as discussed in my video on extraterrestrial life. Below a certain pressure, a substance sublimes as it heats up. It goes straight from solid to gas. Essentially, in a vacuum, zero pressure, liquids can't exist. Basically, a liquid is a gas compressed due to pressure. It's too hot to be a solid, but the pressure is too high for it to be a gas, so it ends up with some properties of a solid and some properties of a gas. The Earth has liquid water because the atmospheric pressure at the surface is high enough. Mars doesn't have liquid water because the pressure is too low. Earth has had liquid water for at least 3.8 billion years. There are three main hypotheses for its origin, 
none can account for all of the Earth's water, so all are likely true to some extent. Condensation. Water formed with the rest of the Earth via core accretion. Earth formed nearer to the Sun than the frost line, so this method can't account for much water. Hydrogen reactions. Hydrogen and oxygen compounds in the early Earth reacted to form water. And finally, extraplanetary sources. Icy comets, asteroids and planetesimals formed beyond the frost line and delivered water to the Earth by collision. And that's our tour of the solar system completed. We've learned about the different objects in our solar system, how they move and orbit, how we've explored them, and how the solar system formed. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and have an excellent day.